Let's talk about some of the things that seem to work across the board to improve strength, improve hypertrophy, and improve nerve to muscle communication and performance. The first thing that's absolutely key for nerve to muscle communication and physical performance of any kind might not sound that exciting to you, but it is very exciting, and that's salt. Nerves, nerve cells, neurons, communicate with each other and communicate with muscle by electricity. But that electricity is generated by particular ions moving into and out of the neuron. And the rushing in of a particular ion, sodium, salt, is what allows nerve cells to fire. If you don't have enough salt in your system, your neurons and your brain and your nerve to muscle communication will be terrible. If you have sufficient salt, it will be excellent. How much salt will depend on how much water you're drinking, how much caffeine you're drinking, and how much food you're ingesting. So, and whether or not you're taking any diuretics, how hot it is, et cetera, how much you're sweating. So you want to make sure that you have enough salt, potassium, and magnesium in your system if you want to perform well. I realize that salt isn't a very glamorous uh, performance tool, but it is vital. It is absolutely vital. And the endurance athletes and the people that train in high heat can uh, speak to the fact that when your electrolytes are low, your brain doesn't function, your body doesn't function nearly as well. In fact, even for mental work, for studying and for writing and for doing math and coding, doing analytic work of any kind, even a hard conversation that's important to you, having sufficient electrolytes is really going to help and being low on electrolytes won't help. And just drinking water won't help because you need electrolytes. The other thing that's been shown over and over again, numerous well-controlled studies to improve muscle performance is creatine. Early on, there was a lot of controversy about creatine, but there are many studies. If you want, you can go to this website that everyone now knows I love, which is this free website, examine.com, that there are no fewer than 18 studies there, um, 66 studies. Uh, so 18 studies supporting that muscle creatine content can be increased by ingesting creatine. How much creatine? Well, I asked the experts and they tell me that for somebody who's about 180 pounds, five grams a day should be sufficient or so heavier than 180. So if you get like if you're a 220 pound or 230 pound person, 10 to 15 grams of creatine, people lighter than 180 pounds, maybe three to five grams of protein, uh, excuse me, creatine, or even one to th three grams creatine is a fuel source at for early early in bouts of activity for high intensity activity it is also a fuel source for neurons in the brain and it can have some cognitive enhancing effects so creatine is a very interesting molecule early on when it was released as a supplement it was um it was thought that you had to load it in higher dosages for a few days and then maintain it at um, lower dosages so you take you know 20 or 30 grams a day then back off to five or ten it doesn't seem to be the case that you can get all the benefits from taking the dosages at the low level. I just mentioned a few moments ago uh, as they relate to body weight throughout. So salt and electrolytes, absolutely key. You need those present. You need to be well hydrated. Creatine seems to have a performance enhancing effect. There are 66 studies, 66, showing that power output is greatly increased anywhere from 12 to 20%. And this is sprinting and running and jumping as well as weightlifting by creatine. The ability to um, hydrate your body is improved by creatine because of the way that it brings more uh, water into cells of various kinds. As an indirect effect, it can help in increase lean mass because of the way that it brings more water into muscle and probably also because of the way that if you get stronger, you can generate more force and generate more hypertrophy. It reduces fatigue. Seven studies have shown that it reduces fatigue. Um, there are even some interesting effects on improving cognition after traumatic brain injury, although that's a serious medical condition and situation. So you absolutely should talk to a board certified physician before adding anything or taking anything out of your current regimen. Uh, there are a few other effects that are interesting and notable, um, but the big ones are the ones that I referred to before about increased power output, etc. And I just want to emphasize that creatine can increase this hormone that we talked about in the testosterone episode, dihydrotestosterone, which um, is testosterone converted by 5-alpha reductase into dihydrotestosterone. It's the more dominant androgen in humans, leads to increases in strength and libido and so forth. It also can increase male pattern baldness. Some people, not everybody, 
experience some hair loss with creatine. Other people don't. Some people experience accelerated beard growth because basically DHT has the opposite effect on hair follicles on the face as it does on the scalp. Some people don't. Women uh, who ingest creatine, there are essentially no data showing that it, it increases hair loss or facial hair growth. Um, but of course, everyone is different. So you can go to examine.com. You can explore those studies. So creatine, definitely a powerful performance enhancing molecule. The other one, uh, one that uh, personally I've never tried, but that seems to have a uh, very strong and well-supported effects is beta alanine. Now, beta alanine is interesting because when you hear about weight training, you think about heavy deadlifts and bench presses, all that kind of stuff that people are doing. But beta alanine seems to support exercise that is, that is of slightly longer duration. So a, a mix of anaerobic and aerobic type movement. So things, these are physical performance in the 60 to 240 second range. So you can use y your mind and kind of figure out, you know, like things that weights of the, um, that limit you to eight to 15 repetitions, cardiovascular exercise of the sort, like rowing or sprinting. So interval work, it seems to help with that kind of work. So we're not talking about long runs. We're not talking about heavy deadlifts. The standard dose is somewhere between two and five grams. Again, as always, check with a doctor. Make sure these things are safe for you. I'm not responsible for your health. You are. I don't say that just to protect me. I'd say that also to, to protect you. But it really seems to improve muscular endurance, improve anaerobic running capacity, reduce fatigue. There are even some interesting effects on reduction of body fat and improvements in lean mass. So creatine, beta alanine, electrolytes, these are kind of the, the core three things that seem to improve performance and are well supported by the scientific literature. And in the earlier episode on supercharging performance, we talked about Palmer cooling. That's certainly a performance enhancing tool. It's nothing you ingest. You're cooling your palms in a very specific way. That's very powerful. Now, what about for longer duration bouts of exercise? We've mainly been focusing on resistance training, but what about for long runs, long swims, these kinds of things? Well, it does seem that beet juice and ingesting things like arginine and citrulline can improve performance for those long bouts of exercise. That's mainly going to be due to effects of those compounds on vasodilation. It's going to open up the vasculature and allow more blood flow. Do note that things like citrulline and arginine can have some um, side effects, if you will. Um, they can increase the likelihood of having um, herpes cold sore outbreaks on the mouth. The arginine is in the pathway by which, I don't know if people know this, but the herpes virus lives on neurons of the trigeminal nerve that innervate the lips and the eyes um, and the mucous membranes of the face. So this is the herpes type one simplex virus. The virus lives on those neurons and then periodically inflames those neurons and that's what leads to the cold sore. It seems like arginine and citrulline can lead to increases in cold sores and canker sores and outbreaks of those kinds. So you wanna be aware of that. Um, that's not everybody, but, and not everybody is carrying um, HSV-1. Uh, just be aware that I think it's now 80 or 90% of people um, by the time they are 12 years old, they're con they've contracted HSV-1. It's very contagious. Um, and typically, we we'll get one outbreak, and then only under conditions of stress or heightened arginine or citrulline ingestion, we'll have them later. Um, again, this is the this is not a uh, necessarily a sexually an STI. This is a um, sexually transmitted infection. This is uh, an infection that is passed very easily from mucous membranes, just in terms of touching objects and things of that sort. Very common in the in the general population. Any discussion about muscle and muscle performance would not be adequate if we didn't mention something about nutrition. But rather than have a whole discussion about nutrition, because there's lots of information about that online. Like for instance, if you want to gain muscle, that you need to have a caloric surplus of about 10 to 15 percent. Uh, you could have a caloric surplus of more. If you want to avoid um, gaining weight, then you would not in, in create a caloric surplus, etc. You can find all that information online. That's not what this podcast is really about. We had a month uh, where we talked a lot about hormones and food and mood. So we talked about foods, but more as they relate to the nervous system. When it comes to supporting muscle, to supporting the synthesis of larger, what I call myosin balloons, it does seem that ingesting 700 to 3000 milligrams of the essential amino acid leucine with each meal is important. Now that does not necessarily mean from supplements. In fact, most people recommend that you get your 
protein, you get your amino acids, including your essential amino acids and your leucine from whole foods. High quality proteins are high density proteins. What do you mean by that? Well, it is true that a lot of sources of protein are found in things like beans and nuts and things like that, that all the essential amino acids can be found there. But per unit calorie, if it's in your practice, if it, and it's in your ethics to ingest animal proteins, it's true that, for instance, 200 uh, calories of steak or chicken or fish or eggs will have a higher density of essential amino acids than the equivalent amount of calories from nuts or plants. That's just simply the way it works. So I'm not, for the vegans and vegetarians, I'm certainly... Um, not saying there's no way that you can uh, support muscle growth. You absolutely can. Some of them might want to supplement leucine, but this 700 to 3000 milligrams of leucine per meal is one of the best ways that's been shown to support the synthesis of more myosin if your goal is hypertrophy. And it's also the way that you would support muscle repair if your goal is strength. So that's specifically geared towards muscle hypertrophy and strength. And I encourage you to think about this protein density issue. And it, whether or not you in, ingest animal uh, proteins or you don't, to think about whether or not you're getting sufficient essential amino acids, especially leucine. Now, many people have addressed the question of whether or not you need to eat six or seven times a day. It turns out that you don't. That's kind of the old school thinking that you need to eat very frequently. I think for certain athletes who are very active for drug assisted, meaning people that are enhancing their testosterone levels to super physiological levels where they are experiencing very heightened levels of protein synthesis and they can utilize all that, that might make sense. Again, I'm not supporting the use of those performance enhancing drugs, but there are people doing that. And that's one of the reasons why they eat so frequently and so much protein for typical people who are not doing that, I imagine most of you are not, then it does appear that you need to eat, but you don't need to eat six or seven times a day. It does seem like not eating once a day is also important. So somewhere between one meal a day and six meals a day lies the more reasonable two or three or maybe four times a day. I think that a whole discussion about this is, is warranted and we'll have this discussion with Dr. Galpin in a, at a future time of how whether or not eating protein more frequently can enhance this my myosin synthesis. But I think the simple takeaway from the literature that I was able to extract and from my discussion with, with him is eating two to four times a day, making sure you're getting sufficient uh, amino acids in a way that's compatible with your ethics and with your nutritional regimen is going to support um, muscle repair, muscle growth, strength improvements, etc. Just 